Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to today's webcast. At this time, all lines have been placed on listen-only mode, and the floor will be open for your questions and comments following the presentation. If you'd like to ask a question during the webcast, you may do so by clicking on the Ask a Question button located below the presentation. Simply type, simply type your question into that box and hit Submit. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the floor over to Martha Kitty Lidu. Ma'am, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Patrick. I am Martha Kirilidou, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the Analyzing Age and Race Ethnicity Demographics. This is an in-depth look into some of the insights we can gain by analyzing data we collect through the ARL Annual Salary Survey. And this webcast is the last of four webcasts we held during this year uh, featuring work related to uh, the data collected through this Annual Salary Survey uh, publication. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you for joining us, and I have a couple of logistical things for you. Everyone will be muted to cut down on background noise. We do welcome questions, though. Please type your questions, and we stand ready to answer all of them. Questions and answers that we do address as well as those we don't we will be distributed to attendees after the webcast, along with a recording that will be available on the ARL YouTube channel. It has been my privilege to work for a number of years with a number of, with all the ARL uh, libraries and uh, the people who submit the salary survey. And it is my privilege to be here today with you with two of my dear colleagues, Mark Puente and Stanley Wilder. Mark Puente is the Director of Diversity and Leadership Programs here at the Association of Research Libraries. And Stanley Wilder is a university librarian at the University of North Carolina in Charlotte. And I've been working with Stanley and the demographic data on the salary survey for many, many years. So we have put this webcast together with the following goals in mind. How are demographic trends in our organizations comparing uh, with the general U.S. trends? What are our retirement trends? How are these trends affecting the racial and ethnic composition of the profession? And what are the job categories with the highest growth and how the new entrants coming into um, and how are the new entrants coming into the profession through through what job categories? Now for um, these goals, the following agenda is addressing them. Uh, Mark will look at uh, some enrollment data in colleges and universities and how these compare to the ARL data on race and ethnicity and the work ARL is doing on diversity and leadership programs that he's managing. And then Stanley will uh, discuss with us issues related to professionalization and retirements, changes in the workforce, and implications for the profession and our organizations. Now, before we um, move forward, we have a poll question, and our poll question, I'm uh, going to pose the question, uh, says, has your library had any staff members involved with ARL's leadership and diversity programs? Um, and you have a minute or so to answer your question. And uh, this is going to be an introduction to the next session that uh, Mark will lead. Uh, let me, we do have some responses go back, uh, coming in. Here are the results. Uh, we have 57% of you that said, yes, people have gone through these programs. Uh, so, Mark, this is an audience that... Uh, uh, you know very well the Pretty story engaged. is yours. Right, mm -hmm. exactly. Fairly engaged. Well, thank you. Thank you, Martha. Thanks for the opportunity to speak to the audience today. Uh, as Martha indicated, I direct uh, diversity and leadership programs for the Association of Research Libraries. They have been around for quite a, a while, a few decades, uh, starting in the early 90s. I think that it's always helpful, if we we'll go to the next slide, 
um, always helpful for us to frame these sorts of discussions, any discussion about race and ethnicity, with just a quick hand on the pulse, if you will, to check where we are and where we're headed, perhaps, with respect to representation in this context, of course, within the United States. We know from, of course, news sources, from the political pundits, and, of course, from uh, other experts, of course, that the landscape of the U.S. is changing very quickly and very dramatically. Uh, this pie chart, of course, represents data from the U.S. Census Bureau in the last census in 2010, and it shows a majority population um, of 67.5% uh, along with um, or within the five major ethnic racial categories uh, and understanding, of course, that there are many, many ethnicities represented uh, within each of those pies. Uh, but uh, even that in itself, of course, we know is a bit problematic uh, given the growing number of people in the United States and in Canada, I would say, who are identifying as mixed or multiracial uh, or biracial. So uh, this graph, of course, represents, uh, it shows projections for what this makeup might look like by the middle of the century. Of course, given the fairly dramatic changes in minority representation that happened in the U.S. from 2000 to 2010, it's fair to say that many experts believe that we're going to meet that threshold, that is, the day when the U.S. is a minority-majority population much sooner than uh, by that uh, 2000. And 50. Okay, for the next slide, um, we will dry, drill down just a little bit more deeply to analyze data from our immediate constituencies. Uh, we see in this pie chart uh, the data were derived from the National Center for Education Statistics, and it provides a snap snapshot of the demographic landscape from 2009 in terms of higher education enrollment in the U.S. Of course, always, you know, with some, some caveats and exceptions, uh, particularly with uh, respect to the racial and ethnic categories, this pie chart uh, closely resembles the 2010 Census Bureau statistics with enrollment of, again, those majority uh, cultures, the, two, the, the Caucasian representation at about 62%, if you remember uh, the 2010 census indicated 67.5% uh, Caucasian representation. So in the next slide, I think we will see, uh, again, some projections for this going forward. Um, this is, let's see, should we go ahead even further, or are we perhaps missing that? slide, Martha. The NCS, uh, higher education enrollment. Okay. So what, what NCS is actually proje projecting is that the, the changes into um, the next, I don't know, six or seven years, perhaps through 2020, will be um, even more dramatic than, than what's re represented here in 2009. Again, with the caveats and the qualifications that, um, you know, for example, minority populations are more likely than their majority culture counterparts to be enrolled in, for example, two-year institutions. Um, I think it's also very interesting to look at current birth rates in the U.S. Um, for example, there was an analysis um, of the 2010 U.S. census done by the Brookings Institution, uh, and they, they estimated that in 2012 there were approximately 14 states with minority-majority populations within their toddler populations, that is, the children uh, ages five and younger. So I think the possible implications for the class of 2030 are pretty great. I think it's um, also interesting to note that some of those were in states such as Maryland, Delaware, and Mississippi, uh, and not just the border states, as one might predict. So let's see what we have in the next slide. Um, so what does this, all of this look like within the context of uh, the admittedly small sample uh, that is the makeup of ARL member institutions? Um, again, qualifying that these data reflect U.S. university libraries and, uh, in this instance, uh, law and medical libraries as well. We are currently at about 14.5% minority representation within professional staff. Um, it is perhaps not really fair to look at peer associations or the profession writ large uh, since the salary survey data uh, are updated very regularly and are uh, more recent than some of uh, some other groups. But nevertheless, um, in case you were wondering, uh, that representation is a bit higher than what ALA reported in its update 
to its diversity count reports just last year. Uh, in that report, they uh, estimated that public, academic, and school library minority representation was at about 12%. Uh, and, of course, ARL member organizations are a bit more diverse than other organizations, such as ACRL, the Society of American Archivists, the Medical Library Association, and other associations, recognizing, of course, that you know the methodologies for data collection for those groups are quite different than what we use here at ARL. And again, those, those data are not quite as recent. But if we analyze this data just a little bit deeper, we do see somewhat larger divides uh, in representation, especially uh, in respect to managerial or leadership positions within ARL libraries. The 2012 and 2013 ARL salary survey, which the previous pie was, was representing, will show that 5.4% uh, of uh, ARL directors um, are from underrepresented groups, traditionally underrepresented groups, and that's out of a sample of 112. Uh, although recent placements uh, within our membership I think will result in higher percentages in 2013. Also, I think it's interesting to note that uh, among assistant directors and associate directors, representation is at 7.8% and 9.5% respectively. So uh, those uh, percentages are a bit lower. So this graph I think is very interesting, and it's also directly related to what Stanley will be addressing a little bit later in uh, our hour here together. Um, although our efforts to diversify the professional workforce in ARL libraries have um, uh, has resulted in only incremental gains over the last five to ten years, we seem to be uh, positioned for greater gains, I think, in the future. Uh, yes, our representation is a little bit higher than the profession writ large, but then also, somewhat like the population statistics for the U.S., professional librarians from traditionally underrepresented groups are a bit younger uh, to the profession than their counterparts from majority populations. And this, um, these bars here uh, have uh, several ranges uh, representing several ranges of years of experience within the profession. And you see here that most minority professionals in ARL university libraries reported having somewhere be having between either four to seven years of professional experience and eight to 11 years of experience. So those are the two largest groups. And I think it'll be um, interesting to see uh, Stanley slides a little bit later when we talk about um, demographic age, age demographic and retirement trends a little bit later. Um, some may be wondering and, uh, and, and thinking about, uh, although it's, we don't have uh, graphs represented here, there is, of course, a small gap in pay between men and women, no surprise, uh, and a larger gap in average pay between all women and, of course, just minority women. There's a gap of about $4,200 uh, when you analyze those data. Uh, of course, there also may be other variables at play uh, here than just race or ethnicity, uh, given what uh, we see in front of us with respect to the experience factor. And yes, within ARL libraries, women comprise 63% of the professional workforce and men just above 37%. So um, yes, it remains somewhat dominated, our profession, by uh, the female gender. So if we go to the, uh, the next slide, um, why is it important at all to track these data, to compare these data against national trends, and to have a sense about what this all looks like. Um, and this is, I think, a, a, a healthy model. Uh, there's certainly a, a lot of, of science and a lot of research around the value that diversity brings to organizations. Uh, this particular model, the attraction selection attrition model, is one that we use quite frequently here uh, at ARL. Um, and it, it, it speaks to organizations and how uh, people, it, it, it sort of operates on the presumption that people are differentially attracted to their careers as a function of their own interests and their personalities. So basically people make the place. They create the organizational culture, they create climate, uh, and they create the practices, um, all of those are determined by the people of the organization. And it is those people that uh, really inform how others, outsiders coming into those communities are socialized. <clears throat> Excuse me. So if we look at this model, <clears throat> um, organizations uh, select people uh, 
in, into their organizations who they think are compatible for a variety of different functions within the organization. Uh, people invite other people to be part of their organization who share common attributes and not necessarily just competencies, and we know that well from, from librarianship. The attrition bubble that's represented there is, of course, the opposite side of attraction. When people don't fit into an environment, they tend to leave it. Um, this leaves a more homogeneous group than even what was originally attracted to the organization. So there's certainly a great deal of science, again, as I mentioned, that provide evidence that, in fact, more homogeneous organizations are, in fact, less effective at problem solving and less agile in the face of change which we all know for libraries is the norm uh, rather than the exception. So uh, this, this model helps to, I think, help us think about that attrition and attraction related to how we recruit naturally and, of course, how we retain uh, our workforce and the effect that has on creating a diverse um, organization. So. So that is really um, where we stand. Uh, I did want to just briefly go over uh, on the next slide uh, the range of um, programs that we manage here at ARL, our diversity and leadership program. So there are uh, many programs in our portfolio related specifically to diversity. We have four Institute of Museum and Library Services funded um, diversity recruitment programs, the Initiative to Recruit a Diverse Workforce, the Career Enhancement Program, the ARL Music Library Association Diversity Inclusion Initiative, and our most recent effort, a collaborative program with the Society of American Archivists, the Mosaic Program. And the other two bullet points um, are related to our leadership development programs. Our longest standing being the uh, LCDP, the Leadership and Career Development Program started in 1997, and the ARL Leadership Development Program. Uh, and this slide uh, just also provides some additional information about uh, what uh, sits under the diversity and leadership portfolio, including our Career Resources website, um, a leadership symposium that is held every January, and uh, the National Diversity and Libraries Conference. And our next offering will be, we hope, in 2016. So just a brief, um, just a brief run through of our, our, our products and our programs and how they relate to our membership. Uh, we do feel that uh, there is some impact, some effect on our membership in a, in a positive way with respect to um, representation, but we also recognize that uh, being an inclusive um, organization goes much beyond uh, just mere representation and including an environment where diverse people can thrive uh, and really succeed. So that uh, sums up my comments. Thank you, Mark. Now, we do have a poll that uh, relates to the attraction, selection, and attrition model you presented. Uh, and uh, I did pose the question to the audience. It says, describe your attraction, selection, attrition pipeline in the last three years. And it gives them um, some options, two, four options to select. Uh, the first says more people have been hired than left retired. The second option, more have left or retired than hired. The third option is hired and left or retired balanced each other. So uh, the same number, more or less, has come in and out. And the fourth option, not much hiring is happening or not much um, Living and retiring is happening, and um, um, let's see um, what the results um, look like. We see that uh, uh, overall the group with the largest uh, uh, segment, 56%, is the one where number three, uh, where the number of, that have come in and the number that have gone out uh, balances each other. Uh, the second largest group with 37% more have left and uh, only 6% have hired more people. Um, this is interesting. Uh, we do have another uh, poll later on that um, relates that to some of the economic trends. Uh, but uh, before I go there, I wanted to also mention that what uh, Mark presented as the attraction selection and attrition model is also um, something
something we use in the climate qual uh, line of research, which is an organizational um, tool we have to measure um, climate and diversity. And here is um, the next poll question that relates to the economy. Do you have the sense that staff are delaying retirement due to the economy? Uh, this is Stanley uh, gave us this poll question, and you can vote. And as the votes come in, let me see how many we have. Most people have voted, so I'm going to show you the results. And uh, the results uh, indicate that, yes, 70% uh, said that more people are delaying retirement. 29% said, no, that that's not happening. Um, so clearly we have some trends that uh, are affected by the economy. So as we move forward into our next uh, speaker, I wanted to emphasize that what we are going to focus on and what Stanley has worked with um, is data that uh, we collect through the ARL Annual Salary Survey, but they are our quinquennial data. These are the data we collect every five years. There are certain data elements we collect every five years. And the most probably important of those data elements is the year of birth, uh, which is what uh, Stanley has used to calculate and study the age demographics. Some of the other variables you see here, additional job codes, library degree, and other degree are also collected on a quinquennial basis, and we also have a variable called years in the library uh, as part of that uh, five-year cycle, and uh, using these years in the library in relation to years of experience allows us to uh, define the entrance to the profession. And Stanley uh, has started working on this many, many years ago. Uh, here is some of the earlier report um, uh, that uh, uh, he did. Uh, there were two monographs ARL published with his data, the first one back in 1995 entitled The Age Demographics of Academic Librarianship at the time when we were realizing you know, our profession is shifting rapidly. In 2003, we I think we were more cognizant of that shift and uh, his uh, monograph, Demographic Change in Academic Librarianship, highlighted the latest uh, status of that shift. And uh, more recently, uh, in 2000, he did a bimonthly report, and he is now working on uh, analyzing the more recent data. Uh, so, Stanley, are you there? I am here. Thank you. Great. Thank you for having me. Uh, great. Well, right here in 2013, research libraries are smack in the midst of the biggest transition in staffing that we will ever see. Some of this transition is strictly demographic. It's the result of a population of library professionals that's been disproportionately old and aging quickly since at least 1986. As we'll see in a moment, large numbers of us are now reaching retirement age. Were there nothing else going on, we would have to say that we are experiencing now a full-scale changing of the guard. But we're also seeing enormous changes in the demand for skills in research libraries, starting with lower-skilled tasks that are simply disappearing, or, if you like, being replaced with tasks that require much higher skills, or skills that have never been part of a traditional view of a research library portfolio. As we'll see, demand for the new skills is actually crowding out demand for traditional library functions, even reference. This shift in demand is visible everywhere we look in the data, which I'll remind you relates only to library professionals. But these changes are absolutely part of a larger trend affecting all library staff, including student assistants and support staff. Let's start with the demographic changes. The, narr the, the narrative here is simple. The 1960s and 70s produced explosive growth in higher education. 
That growth extended to research libraries to such a degree that even in 2010, the typical professional aged 60 and over began her career in 1975 or earlier. In subsequent years, research library staffing grew much slower, heightening the importance of the population that we added in the 60s and 70s. This is one reason why I argue that the state of our population is not just another story of the dominance of the baby boom generation. So let's have a look at the ARL age data beginning with 1986. This is our... Um, and we'll, uh, Martha, if you can go to 86, there you go. This is our youngest population with almost 40% of us under age 40. And as you'll see, this group dominates the, the population from that point forward. We have then 1990, and we can go forward to 90, Martha. Uh, there you go. Oh, 90 and 94, you can continue. 1998. And forward to 2000, we'll just go straight through 2005, and then finishing up with the most recent data, which, as Martha said, is the 2010 data. Uh, we're now almost 40% of us are aged 55 and over. I, I hope that it's obvious how unsettling this series of curves is. If folks were entering and exiting the population in a consistent fashion, the curve would remain perfectly stable. Instead, since 1986, our population as a whole has been both older than comparable professionals and aging at a rate that approximates the rate at which, at which individuals age. We do not wish to see our profession do what individuals do at the ends of their careers. Actually, we're going to talk a little bit later about whether the instability in the age of our population might actually have a healthy side, but at very least, as of 2010, the population of research li library professionals is at a crossroads. Here's what I mean when I say that our changing of the guard happens right now. We really can't use this data to isolate retirements in a formal way, but we can look at what happens to the number of people, say, in the 60 to 64 age cohort from one data collection to the next. In any given data set, we lose about half of those people um, uh, be in the 60 to 64 cohort by the next data set, and that gives us a loss of about 340 people between 86 and 90. Now, that figure increases steadily until it jumps up between 2005 and 2010 to about 800. That was then, but consider what's happening right now. In 2010, over 15% of the overall population fall in that 60 to 64 age cohort. Over 20% of us are 60 and over. I don't think it's possible for the population to get any older than that, not short of a massive change in retirement behavior, a thing that just shows no sign of occurring. In sum, we are right now in the peak period of retirements for our population. Next, I want to talk about job areas that are unusually old. Now, when I ask this kind of question, I'm thinking about staffing strategy and short-term succession planning. But savvy young people might ask the same question by way of choosing specialization areas. Whatever way you might look at it, we are at risk of losing some types of expertise or finding it much more difficult to recruit appropriate staff. Let's start with two big traditional skill areas. And here we find that 16% of reference and 25% of catalogers were age 60 and over in 2010. I've included the functional specialists in this, in this chart to give a sense that near-term retirements will hit traditional library skill positions far more than non-traditional ones. We're gonna, and then we're going to hold that thought for later. But I feel I need to say something about our catalogers at this juncture. As a percent of the population, in 2010, there were just half as many catalogers in, as there were in 1986, and their share of new hires has dropped even lower. But to say that in 2010, one in four catalogers were age 60 and over, friends, we've got to have a talk here. Do research libraries have a going-forward need for advanced bibliographic or descriptive expertise? 
Well, I think everyone would agree that we need fewer than we did 20 years ago, but how do we propose to maintain any of this expertise in light of the extraordinary high, extraordinarily high levels of retirement that are upon us right now? After cataloging, the next succession planning problem we have relates to management. I say problem, and maybe you would say opportunity. You can decide for yourself. In the overall population, only 5% of us in 2010 were 65 and older. That share among department heads, though, is roughly double, and 30 to 40% of this group were aged 60 and over. So this changing of the guard I've been talking about will apply to leadership even more than to the rank and file. Either way, we really do need, rather urgently, the mentoring programs, the leadership institutes, the systematic succession planning to make sure that we develop or are able to hire folks who are ready to step up and run things. Speaking of running things, I can't leave the subject of old managers without mentioning the special case of library directors. In 2000, Directors aged 65 and older were just 3%, and that's exactly the same as the population as a whole. But 10 years later, that figure is a whopping 23%, and 66% were aged 60 and over. Nothing else comes close. This is the single biggest I knew I was going to have trouble with this succession planning challenge facing research libraries. Okay, before I leave the subject of age, a word about what we can expect of our age curve going forward. You have to ask this question, if only because there's really not as much guesswork about this as you might think, given that we're talking about a variable that comes close to being perfectly predictable. So we can make a pretty good guess as to what happens next, and no, it doesn't involve the profession collapsing and dying. We produced age projections based on the 2000 data to tell us what will happen out to 2020, and so far those projections have proven to be excellent. So here you have, then, the projected um, uh, age from starting in 2010, 2015, and then 2020. You can advance to 2020 um, when you get a chance then, Martha. First, on the old end of this curve, at long last, the steep decline in the older age cohorts that just had to happen, it begins in 2015, and it's steep enough to get us already by 2020 back to a population that's nearly as young as we were in 1986. The changing of the guard then begins in 2010, trails off through 2015, and is finished by 2020. But focusing on the retirees could lead us to miss the importance of the youth movement that's about to occur. Let me cycle back to the actual data and the 2005 and 2010 curves. Um, Martha, if you could go, go to the next one, I can say I didn't have a cue there. Um, the increase in the 2005 and then 2010, um, up to the next one. There we go. The increase in the in the uh, youngest age, age cohorts here is just barely perceptible. I really expected it to be bigger, but 2010 was a serious re recession year, and as we'll see, this really did suppress hiring. From 2010 forward, however, it would take a, an economic catastrophe to prevent the, a serious youth movement. There are just so many senior li librarians about to retire. So the projections have our numbers aged 40 and under rising to 33% in 2015 and in 2020. Speaking of young people, I did a little study on the millennials in our population. These are people who were born in 1980 or later. I really just wanted to get a sense of who these people are. Now, first of all, I have to say there are very few of them, uh, only about 250, and, and mostly I found that they're just like the rest of us in terms of gender, race, education, background, and so on. But they have some interesting differences, too. Uh, as, for example, they're very mobile, uh, even compared to young people in previous years. Almost half of them fill functional specialist positions, and that's a very high rate. But of those functional specialist positions, fully 22% of them are archivists, of all things. I don't know what to make of that. Do you? I think we're probably going to have to keep an eye on this group, which figures to become, in any case, the next dominant age cohort in research librarianship. 
baby boom meet your replacements? Well, we'll all hopeful that we'll be archivists, if not catalogers, but we do have a poll question here, and I'm going to pose the question to the audience, and you have it on your screens, and it reads, what is behind the sharp increase in the number of young people hired for archivist positions? And you have three choices to select from. The first one says growing importance of unique collections of your print. The second, archivists are replacing catalogers. And the third, archivist skill sets match the multi-format needs of modern collections. And uh, we can um, stop the question and uh, let's look at the results here. I'm going to show you the results so you can also see them. We have, uh, oh, interesting uh, distribution, now uh, 43% said the third choice, archivist skill sets, much the multi-format needs of modern collections, but it, uh, it is actually split between the first and the third choice, because 43% also said growing importance of unique collections of our print, and only 12% thought that the archivist uh, and the catalogers are replacing each other. Uh, so um, back to our, to Stanley. Okay, great. Well, I, I want to switch gears now and talk about the other half of the sea change in research library staffing, and that's those relating to changes in demand for skills. And I'm going to start talking about demand for library professionals as reflected in the overall demand for new hires and new professionals. So here you'll see a graph of new hires as a percent of the ARL population. 2010 was, in fact, a down year, though not the lowest in our data series. By this measure, 2010 was a bad year, but maybe not quite the worst. But I really suspect that it was the worst because this 2000 in figure doesn't account for the far higher level of retirements that surely occurred that year. A similar situation affects new professionals. The 2010 numbers are actually the lowest in our data series, um, but here again, I think the same logic ought to apply, that the proper benchmark for 2010 should take account of, of all of those additional vacancies, all of which leaves us with the not astonishing conclusion that 2010 was, in fact, a very bad year for hiring among ARL libraries. But the real news here is who is and isn't getting hired. Let's have a look at what, what jobs these new hires were filling in 2010. And let's look at the top three uh, new, new hire job groups from 1990 to 2010. Okay, wait a minute. Nothing looks right here. First of all, what is it with this FS line here? In 2010, a whopping 36% of new hires categorized as functional specialists. Uh, and you see that that FS curve goes, goes back um, uh, to at least 1990 and shows no sign of slowing down. There's really no telling how high this, um, this curve could go. ARL's phrase functional specialist refers to a hodgepodge of skill areas that includes human resource professionals, preservation specialists, archivists, but functional specialists also include folks who work in IT in one form or another. They're web builders, programmers, that sort of thing, and that accounts for about half of the category. I've been writing about the rise of functional specialists for years, but this 2010 jump really surprised me. I'll have more to say about these people, but, but what about the rest of the curve? How about the sudden and precipitous decline in the demand for traditional, and I would say library school-based skills? As I said, the decline in cataloging hiring isn't new. It began years ago, running at least 10 years ahead of reference. But I think it's important that while the cataloger new hire line is it, it, that the that that the new cataloger new hire line is dropping slowly now, it is still trending down. 
But until the new data set, we couldn't have predicted the decline in demand for reference librarians. Reference is the principal point of entry for our profession, and as a function, it has not been subject to the same kind of inexorable pressure stemming from increased automation and network efficiencies that have reduced our need for catalogers. It is quite true that nationally we've seen a significant decline in reference transaction counts, but the reference instruction function is much bigger than transaction counts, and I'd have thought that this work would prove to be relatively robust. Having been so surprised with these dramatic changes in the composition of new hires, my next question is to ask whether all these new hires have altered the mix of skills in the overall population. And the answer is absolutely, profoundly so. For the first time in the available data, functional specialists constitute the single biggest job category in our libraries. Further, if you remember the advanced age of catalogers and reference librarians, the new hire trends suggest that functional specialists will continue to grow and at the expense of traditional library school expertise areas. Reference, once again, is the shocking part. This job type has been rock solid steady through the data back to 1986, and here in 2010, it falls to its lowest level ever. And we do have another poll question for our audience, uh, Stanley, uh, and I'm going to um, pose the question right here. Um, it asks them whether something, whether the following sentence is true or false. Libraries expend more salary for fewer support staff than they did 10 years ago. And you get to vote true or false on that question. And I'm going to stop the question now and show you the results. And what uh, you see is that 90% uh, said true to this question. Let's go back to um, Stanley and let's see what um, he has to tell us about this transition. Okay. Okay. Well, so far I've talked about the broad age-related transition that we're now experiencing and the huge change in demand for professional expertise that's bringing new skills often at the expense of traditional library skill sets. But I think that there's a problem if we leave it there, a kind of forest for the trees sort of thing. The forest that we risk missing is that these professional trends are part of broader trends that are affecting all library staffing in dramatic ways. Back in June of this year, I published a short article in Library Journal called The End of Lower Skill Employment in Libraries. A sunnier way of saying the same thing is that the library workforce, and I mean all staffing at research libraries, is on a sharp upward trajectory in terms of the skills required as simple routine tasks disappear, replaced by fewer jobs, higher paid jobs, with much higher skills requirements across the board. Here's the case that I make. First, um, as to student assistants, um, we, we, we cycle through to the next one. Uh, student, student assistant jobs are disappearing altogether. Between 2000 and 2012, the AR, ARL median student FTE declined 25%. There's a natural limit to how much uh, how much uh, uh, training a student can 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 get, and I believe that student jobs in libraries will continue to dwindle to a very marginal place in our workforce. Next, the employment of support staff plunged as well, median FTE going down 20 percent. That's huge, but just as significant, the expenditures for support staff actually increased 25 percent. So it's certain that libraries now pay m more money for fewer people in that category. And from this, I infer a shift to higher skill tasks and higher, sk and, uh, and higher skill, higher uh, pay staff. But you can really see the shift to higher skills among professionals. Whereas the other job categories lose FTE, professionals are up 10.5% in that period and expenditures up a whopping 57.5%. I believe that if library professionals cost a lot more than they did 10 years ago, it's because libraries are competing for non-traditional skills for which there is a strong value on the open market. 
I think of these broad changes as professionalization. I know some folks will hear that and, and object that librarians have, al have always been professionals, and of course they have. On the other hand, I feel we need a way of characterizing the steady escalation of skill requirements all over our libraries. A great example is reference work, which I'd argue is orders of magnitude more demanding than it was 20 years ago. And we need a way of expressing the much broader constellation of skills represented in professional positions generally. And finally, we've got to have a way of referring to the new support staff positions. Jim Neal has said that support staff are doing the work that librarians did 10 years ago. And while I can't prove this except to point to that um, higher salaries for fewer workers thing that I mentioned just a moment ago, I really suspect he's spot on in this. But wouldn't it be great to have data tracking changes in our support staff? So let me tie up the elements that I've presented here into a single narrative. Research libraries are voting with their feet as regards filling positions, de-emphasizing traditional skill areas like reference, and increasing hiring of a whole suite of non-traditional skills dominated by computing. The urgent imperative to hire such people is a matter of basic relevance for 21st century research libraries. With these new demands, and in the absence of huge increases in budgets, we are so fortunate that there are important spheres of library work that no longer need to be done. By the same token, it's also fortunate that at this moment of urgent need for non-traditional skills, we just happen to be at the very peak of a generational changing of the guard. So please don't misunderstand me. I do not regard the retirement of our most senior librarians as a good thing. Those people are essential parts of our workforce, and their departure causes many serious problems that require our immediate attention. That said, the departure of such experienced staff is only one of our staffing challenges, and the challenges don't stop there. We've also got to manage all of the, the, the transitions that tag along with it, like credentialing, culture, mission, compensation, and finance. But I expect that if you're even watching this webcast, you, like me, will find these challenges stimulating, even beautiful. We're inventing together the 21st Century Research Library right now. Let's get to work. Thank you. Ready to get to work, Stanley. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for the good message there. Uh, so one question um, that uh, uh, is coming from our audience, the trends in our profession reflect the high demand for computer expertise um, that exists even outside our profession. Uh, how uh, do you think libraries can be competitive in this? Uh, race. I, I think that that, um, that libraries uh, share the very same challenge that our universities do in in terms of um, how to how to match the uh, uh, salaries of the private sector. And in fact, we can just simply say that um, that we can't match those salaries. Um, and as a result, we are going to do the thing that we're doing now, which is being exceptionally creative um, in terms of um, uh, finding what the things that we can sell to folks who have the, the right kinds of expertise, and that might be um, quality of life issues. It might be the um, option of, of um, offering um, educational benefits. Um, it, it, I think to some degree it, um, it has to do with the kind of work we do, because I really have found that, that an important segment of our IT staff absolutely understand and love the challenges that we are that we're that we're working through the kinds of problems that we're that we're facing are are really satisfying to some people and so this this helps us recruit and retain people as well but I'll I'll, I'll grant you that um, that this is a, a a serious problem and it doesn't have um, they look there's no substitute for paying people uh, the salaries that they can get everywhere else Thank you, Stanley. Mark, are you with us? Do you want to take a stab at this question? Well, uh, I was just going to perhaps piggyback a little bit, uh, going back to that attraction selection attrition model, uh, and to figure out a way, my suggestion would be to figure out a way to uh, tap into people with those sorts of competencies that, again, are attracted to the type of organizations that libraries create by their mission, by their functions on campuses and that sort of thing. So I think that there, 
there is an opportunity. I think we share a similar challenge, for example, with respect to recruiting people with the uh, with STEM domain expertise. And yet, um, I think that there has been ARL member institutions have been uh, uh, been able to take advantage of um, of of the sort of. Um, uh, you know, should I say maybe, maybe, maybe some flooding a little bit of <laughs> of people with that sort of a domain expertise into the marketplace. So I think there are some opportunities. You just have to be strategic about uh, that 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 attraction part of it in terms of the recruitment aspect of it. I would like to thank both of you. You brought wonderful information to this webcast. We do have. Oops. Uh, no, it wasn't. Another question. I thought it, there was another one coming. Uh, anything else any of you would like to add before we move into our conclusion part of our webcast? I actually would like to respond to the um, to the poll that had to do with folks delaying their retirement um, because um, uh, I, like all of the poll respondents, um, uh, felt sure that people were really were delaying their their retirements. What we found from the data, though, is that there is absolutely no evidence of this. Um, the uh, there is a slight increase of folks who are 65 and older, let's say. Uh, in 2010, over 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 previous years, but the problem with that is is that that was that was um, part of the projections dating back to to 1995, and and it's really a function of um, uh, well, it's kind of a demographic um, uh, function as opposed to having anything to do with the economy. So I just think I, I just sort of would like to note that that um, that in this case, I think um, our sort of anecdotal sense. Uh, is it, it may not be borne out by the data. Thank you, Stanley. Now it brings actually the uh, issue of looking forward to uh, whether our assumptions are um, informed or uninformed projections, uh, you know, will be confirmed by the next round of data collection uh, we will uh, put together in 2015. Uh, so something to look forward. Uh, in the meantime, we have made some changes uh, into the ARL annual salary survey to reflect better the new environment. And um, uh, as a result of some of these changes, some of the longitudinal comparisons uh, will not be happening anymore because um, we have changed uh, some of the job titles. Uh, we have maintained, though, enough continuity to um, one of the things we did in revising the job titles is to introduce the notion of various specialist positions. We have kept the three broad specialist categories, functional, subject specialist, and administrative specialists. And uh, uh, as a result of uh, you know, introducing, we had functional and subject specialists before, uh, but by introducing the administrative specialist category, uh, now we are in a position with the most recent data uh, on the job codes uh, to say that functional specialist is not the most populous category anymore. Subject specialist is the most populous category this last year. And we are refining uh, for this coming year the subject specialist uh, to um, some breakdowns uh, that try to track that category as it relates to the social sciences, the um, sciences and the humanities, so we'll have a better sense of um, specialization within subject specialists. Now, to some extent, um, these are challenges and opportunities that are creating uh, less hierarchical organizations as we have more technical expertise and a flatter structure. And uh, uh, Stanley um, and Mark brought the issue of uh, competitive salaries. That is something we need to keep addressing. Um, now, what are some of the implications? Is the need to make a stronger case for delivering value? And I did click on this slide. I don't see it there, but um, maybe Patrick can help if. It got stuck somewhere in the ether. Uh, the uh, case of um, making a case for delivering value 
is happening in many of these organizations by um, introducing positions like the library assessment uh, area, assessment librarians, and we are actually capturing uh, the, this job category with the revised um, job category schema. The uh, technical expertise introduces some of these shifting specialties because some relate to budget, some may be relating to development, uh, some may be relating to more traditional uh, technological roles. Um, and ultimately, there is a challenge when um, we are working on making the case for higher salaries in a traditional uh, female profession uh, that um, in the hierarchy of you know, salary um, distribution uh, hasn't fared uh, very high. I do want to bring to everybody's attention that there is corroborating evidence for uh, many of the issues we uh, highlighted in this webcast at the LJ Placement and Salaries, the Library Journal Placement and Salaries article. Uh, Library Journal publishes a piece on placement and salaries every year, so I hope you'll take a look at that. Uh, and I want to remind everybody that uh, we do have on the ARL YouTube channel uh, the webcast from this series, the series entitled Effectively Using the ARL Salary and Demographic Data, and I hope many of you will have a chance to look at the whole series. And on behalf of uh, Mark and Stanley and myself, I want to thank you for attending today's webcast. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. That this concludes today's webcast. We thank you for participation. We now disconnect your lines and have a great day.